They say about us men and women, we, we can't live with them and we can't live without them because guess what? When it comes to a community, you can say, I can't live in it, but I can tell you, you can't live without it. A feeling of, we need a feeling of fellowship with others. When I talk about this word community, I'm not talking or referring to um, the tradition three that normally is taught about the community. Every year I teach my students about the three different communities that we have. You have the urban and suburban and rural. But I'm not talking about just geographical points today because the word community is rooted in the word common. Somebody, somebody say common. Common. A community is us sharing with other humans. Yes, we share space and we share places, but there are other types that I'm talking about when, it, when I'm referring to community. I'm talking about the shared interests, same passions. I'm talking about shared actions, the same attitudes toward bringing change and practice. I'm talking about the shared practice, and I'm talking that is a same profession of confession, and I'm talking about shared circumstances. Someone said this, they asked the question in 2003, they asked this question, what is a good community? And someone answered with this reply, a good community is a cohesive, safe, confident, prosperous, and happy place. It is free of poverty and crime, providing a high quality of life for everyone that lives there. It values and promotes open, participative development processes underpinned by a continuous culture of transgressional learning. When I thought about that response, guess what I realized? There is no community that we can live in that fits that definition of a good community. Really, in reality, there's only one thing in this world that fits if that definition is a glove. There's only one hand that can get into that glove. And that is Jesus Christ's hand that is built upon the body of believers. Talk to me somebody. If we're going to be here in a church, then this is the only place where we're poverty free. And we're crime free and we're providing high quality of life for everyone that lives here who values and open and we want you to participate in the developmental process whereby we can trans go across trans generation, one generation to the next generation and teach generation after generation on how to live. Right, so when I talk about this community concept, on this morning, I want to throw you a Greek word very quickly here, and that Greek word is kamonia. Kamonia has various different meanings in scripture, whereby it's translated into communion, distribution, contribution, communicate, and it is basically simply stated fellowship. In 1 John, now to my scripture, 1 John chapter 1, Verses 3 through 7, John talks about this concept of fellowship. He uses this Greek word, kamonia. And John says this, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Yeah. Now it seems to me that John would say that if we walk in the light as he walks in the light, then he would say that we have fellowship with him. Yeah. 
Because the previous verse, he says that, that when we say that we are in the light and we don't walk with him and we're walking in darkness, then we can't have fellowship with him. But if we are in the light, then John says, and walking in the light, then John says that Christian brethren have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now that is pretty simple and plain, my brothers and sisters in Christ, because, but I want to tell you that verse 7 presents us a problem. Uh huh. Because he says here, he's equating the fact of the matter, he's explaining what a hypocrite is. Y'all know what a hypocrite is, huh? Someone that's fraud. Someone who will lie to you. Yeah. Someone who will crook you out of your stuff. Yeah. And so he says, this is the definition of a hypocrite. A person who says, I am a Christian, but they walk in darkness. Yeah. Watch this. We have a problem. Because he says again in verse 7, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with humanity. Now, he says, of the previous verse, he says this. He says, if you say you're walking in the light, but you're walking in darkness, you are a hypocrite. Again, goodwill, my Christian visitors and those who are listening to me. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. Those who are listening to me on Facebook Live, I want to tell you that verse 7 presents us a problem. Because of that word fellowship. Watch this. The problem lies when Paul begins to talk about what we need to do. Because he says this. Remember, John says, if you say you're in the light, but you're walking in darkness, you're living a life that is contrary to what God will have you to live. That is what walking in darkness says. I claim and I confess, but I, I live a professional life in darkness. I say I'm in the light, but my life says I'm in darkness. Yeah. Here is the problem that we have here. And let me try to explain it. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, Paul is writing to the church of Colossae. And Paul pins these words, therefore, as God's chosen people, your confession is that I'm holy and I'm sanctified. As God's chosen people, holy, dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Y'all can read it with me. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and what? In patience. Now, verse 13. Bear with each other. In what? And forgive one another. Oh my Lord. There's a problem. Did y'all see that? He says, bear with each other and do what? Forgive. And forgive. We we'll walk in darkness when it comes to forgiveness. Amen. Can, can I work this thing out this morning slowly? Because I don't want nobody to shout and bump your head on this ceiling this morning before you hear what God has to say. Watch this. So he says, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against who? Don't have a name there. It could be anybody. If you have a grievance with somebody, forgive as the Lord forgive you. Oh my, we, we are in trouble. Touch your neighbor, say, neighbor, yeah. we're, in we're in trouble. Watch this, because many of us live under the pretense of the fact that I can't forgive the way God forgives. Watch this. How, how do you come up with that? Let me tell you a little story. There is a wonderful story about a cardinal in the Philippines whose name 
was cardinal sin. When the cardinal sin was a bishop, a young lady had in the community claimed that she had visions from Jesus. Bishop Sin was given the task of determining if the visions were real or authentic. And he called her into his office and he interviewed her and after which he made a request of her. He said, daughter, the next time you see Jesus, will you ask him what sins your bishop committed when he was a priest? She said, yes, I'll tell you. He did that because Bishop, the Bishop, Bishop Sin knew that only three people would have known. Himself, the person who he confessed to, and Jesus himself. And so some months pass and this lady comes back and says that Jesus has shown himself to her again. And the Bishop says to her, good. I want one. I got one question. Did you ask him about my sin? She said, "Yes, sir." The gardener says, "What did he say?" She said, "He forgot." <laughs> did y'all catch that one? Uh huh. See, we want we want God to forget our transgressions. We want God to forgive us and forget it, but we live under the blanket statement, I can forgive, but I can't forget. All right. Oh, goodwill, we have a problem. Two, two. Can I say two. it again? Oh, Christian two. brothers, we have a problem. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Facebook viewership, we have ourselves a problem All right. when it comes to colonial fellowship. Yeah. Kevin. Because we have yeah. broken fellowship because yeah. we don't know how to forgive. As Paul said, what? you do it just like hmm. the Lord forgave you. Hmm. But we live under the blanket statement, I can forgive, but I cannot forget. Let me tell you that we want God to hold true to his ability to influence. And this is what we have prayed for such a long time. When I was a child and you were a child and you taught your children and you taught your grandchildren, you taught your nieces and your nephews and all of them who are in dear to you as children to pray this prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. Uh-huh. And then we get to that point where we say, forgive me of my transgressions as I forgive my transgressors. Some of you may have learned it. Forgive me of my debts as I forgive my debtors. Now, do you understand what that statement is saying? God, forgive me the way I forgive. But then I turn around and testify and say that I can forgive. Come on here, Pastor. I can't forgive. How dare we stand and put ourselves in such a predicament in a hypocritical condition whereby we will quote Isaiah 43 verses 24 and 25 where God said you have brought bought me, you have bought me no sweet cane with your silver nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices but you have burdened me with your sins you have wearied me with your iniquities and verse 25 is what we like to say he says, I, yes, I am he who blot out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Yeah. We want that about ourselves and our relationship with God and we want God to forget it, but we won't forget it. God is so rich about his understanding and so sincere about this condition of forgetting when it comes to forgiveness that he had the Hebrew writer, we quote it again in Hebrews 8 verse 12, he says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. 
But can I give you a confession right here? When we say, Lord, forgive me of my debts as I forgive my debtors, remember that the Lord's Prayer is a model. It is an expectation. It is what Jesus is saying. This is how you should pray. You shouldn't pray like the, hip, like the hypocritical Pharisee or Sadducee who stands in public and he cries out loud and boastfully and pridefully. This is not how you should do it. He is teaching the disciple in the book of Luke on how to pray. Therefore, the words that we are quoting here is a model of how we should do it. Uh huh. It's, it's God's standard. In other words, it is what Paul said that we ought to forgive as God forgave. Listen, so it is a standard that we ought to reach, and God has an expectation that we ought to reach His standard. And what is His standard? His standard is holiness. movie was centered around a character named Neo, another character named Morpheus. Morpheus believed in the prophecy that one day the one would come by and free humanity from their true reality, whereby what they was doing wasn't real in their reality. They was being controlled by this computer program and all the humans that was working and going to work was not really seeing what was real because the real reality was that they was living in some little time, this little capture, and they was plugged into a machine that was draining their life out of them. And when this is what he offered Neo on that night. He said, if you take the blue pill, then you will wake up in your bed in the morning and you will believe whatever you want to believe. But if you take the red pill, you will stay in wonderment. And I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. It, it's your decision. It's your decision. It's, 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 it's what you want to know. But I, I come to offer you a true reality of this statement, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Do you want the red one or do you want the blue one? If you want the blue one, you can go home right now. But if you want the red one, stay just a little bit longer. Amen. So, so watch this. So, when we talk about come kneel and 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 fellowshipping and having a peer communion and distribution and contribution, whereby we are communicating and walking together, you must understand that we come short when we fall under this statement. But it's time for us to come out of the matrix because Paul says this. When he says to the Colossians, he says, take off. Did y'all catch that? He says, take off. He's, he's putting in our mind the thought of taking off clothes. And let me break it down to you like this. During that day, when they was becoming Christians, they would walk down to the river when they would confess that they was believing. And the man who was walking down to the river, he before he gets into the river, he would take off his old clothes. 
And he would get in the water with just his undergarments on. He would be baptized and he would be raised up. And when he comes out of the river, he walks by the old clothes and someone would be there to hand him a new white robe. He would put on that new right robe and go into his house and through the community. And everybody in town would know that he was changed. Amen. But the reality of it is that he had in those old clothes, he was leaving them down at the river to never have his past hunt him. But how often time we as Christians who are making this proclamation that I can forgive but I can't forget, that means that you have the same old past experiences hunting you right now. Mm. Can I tell you that it's time again to get out of the matrix? Watch this. So, watch this. So, we have to, some report number two, we have to disassociate ourselves from our what? Past. past pains. Amen. Not just our past, because I have some good experiences in my past that I wish I could revisit every now and then. Like when I first met my wife, I wish I could go back. Amen. Oh, y'all not hearing me up in here. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could go back to, those, to that moment when I first laid my eyes on that, the junior high at that youth conference. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, you have some experiences in your past that you wish that you can get back and have that experience, but then you have some experiences in your past that you wish you had never went through and you don't care to go back to them. Those are the experiences, the pains that hurt us right now. Wow. Watch this. So as I look at this and I begin to think about what I'm talking, what Paul is talking about in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul writes this before he says, put on forgiveness. Watch this. Because Paul understood that before you can get baptized, he was painting that picture. You got to take off some stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, 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 don't, you didn't wake up um, this morning and put clothes on top of pants. Well... You didn't put pants and a shirt on top of a shirt and a tie up on top of a tie and two and three, four socks yeah. like these young folk are doing where they're wearing four or five gym shorts underneath their pants. I don't know why those pants allowing that stuff to happen. <laughs> Watch this. So he says, you got to take off some stuff. Watch what he says. He says, but now he also put off all these. What are they? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Listen, he was so sincere about this, for he wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, he says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, calamity, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But be ye kind towards one another. Yeah. Tenderhearted. Again, forgiving one another. As God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Listen. You can be in the right spot. The right spot in your life. The right conditions in your life the right people in your life. But because you didn't take off nothing. Wow. Amen. You have broken fellowship. Yeah. You, you got, you got, you got, you got all the right stuff. You got all the right conditions around you. But because you got on the wrong clothes, you can't enjoy the moment. Yeah. Let me try to do it like this so y'all can understand this. Since I used my wife as an example, I use it again. There are moments whereby we go out in the town and, and, and we're going out and I, I'm the type where it don't really matter to me, just a lot. It don't really matter to me. I walk out with a wrinkle shirt, wrinkle t-shirt, just pull it out off the bottom of the stack. I'll put it on, put on wrinkle jeans, and I put on a little 
tennis shoes, dirty or not dirty, and I'll go and eat, eat supper with my wife, go on a date like that. And I've tried that before. And every time she looked at me cross-eyed before we walked out the door and said, where do you think you go? Uh-huh. You, you going out looking like that? And I'll say, yes, this is how I'm going out. No, you're not going out like that. We, we're going out. We're going to enjoy ourselves. And in my mind, I said, I did all of that to get you. Why do I need to do it now? Because I got the right woman on my side, and I got a beautiful woman on my side, and I'm going out to enjoy fellowship, but I got the wrong clothes on, and I'm about to mess up the date before we even get started. And many of us are living our life just like that example whereby we are in the right circumstances, around the right people, in the right conditions, but we're wearing the wrong clothes. Because we haven't gotten out of the matrix yet. But how do we get out of it myself from that past pain? Because y'all know we have a past pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all yeah. looking at these light bulbs, huh? Y'all be looking at them. See, our past pain is this. You know, we got the young man who, who have grown up in a family whereby the family has to have the right social standards and, and have all the right image. And so they don't realize that the son or the daughter is dealing with a whole lot of stuff. That's why y'all folks like to say, preacher kids are bad. <laughs> Because the preacher kids have to live above a standard than everybody else's kids. Amen. They have kids just like everybody else's kids. And so they live under this superstition standard that everybody put them under, whereby they got to be like this. They can't listen to rap music. They can't play basketball and look at the referee cross-sided because they don't supposed to do that because their daddy is a pastor. Come on here. Uh-huh. And so, so we have these circumstances. And let me give you a secret because this is the red pill here. Most of the time, our first experience with pain doesn't happen when you're a teenage girl on Valentine's and you realize that the young man have gave you a card and then you walked around the corner and gave it to somebody else. That's not your first experience, my brothers, when you realize that that girl is treating you just like you're treating her. You think you're a player, she a player, and barely added to you. <laughs> See, that's not your first experience. Your first experience of pain didn't happen when you got a divorce. Your first experience of pain uh, did not happen when you became a single mom. You, and you realized and labeled that that man wasn't going to be there for you and be there for your child. That wasn't your first experience with pain. It didn't happen when you got old as a teenager and in your 20s and 30s. It didn't happen like that because in reality, our pain starts in the very household where you were born in. Yeah. All right. Because we spend most of our time in the household. We spend 18 years in the household. And that first pain that you experienced came from the woman who gave birth to you. When she said, don't you do that again or I'll snap the left. I don't know how they get to talking. I brought you into this world and I'll take you out of this world. And you're sitting there looking at them and thinking to yourself, why would you treat me like that? Why did you do me like that? That is your first experience with pain when you come to realize that your daddy isn't always right. Your mama isn't that perfect. And so you sit there and you got to suck it up and draw in your lips and bite your tongue, even though you want to tell them how wrong they are. But you know better than that because you can't say that to your caregiver. And so you sit there and guess what? You've been cracked. I'm trying to take this. And now you're old. And I'm old. And I get around and feel like you treat me the way mom and daddy treat me. I get a man or a woman who treated me the way mama or an uncle treated me. They don't really care about me. And so that crack now becomes broken. 
Guess what? Every time you have gotten stepped on, you we were stepped on by Satan. Because one thing about Satan, he told the truth one time. In the book of Job, God said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to and fro, yeah. seeking who I made the Bible. God, I can't lie about it. I'm just going to tell you the truth yeah. this one time. Yeah. And so he walked down, and he saw you at that high school. He saw you at that park, and he <laughs> stepped on you. Well, you was cracked before by your parents. Now you're broken by your husband and wife. And then he comes over and he finds someone else. And somebody may be saying that mom and daddy cracked me and broke me. And he didn't leave you right there laying there on the ground. He picked you up. Open the trash can. All right, now. And pulled you out. He brought, he got your friend. Pulled them out. He got your pastor and your deacons. Pulled them out. Your praise worship leaders and praise team members and missionaries and sisters and pulled all of us into a trash can. And then told us to think like this. I can forgive, but I never can forget. Thank you all for falling for that trick. And he put the lid on us and now we're living in the trash can. We think we are living in the light. We think that we got it going on, but we're living in a trash can as long as the lid is labeled, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Many times we're living in the experience of the fact that we are not healed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said there's power in the name of Jesus. But there's power to heal. There's power to deliver. But I haven't been delivered from my past experiences. My God. I can't love my wife because of my past experiences. I can't get along with the pastor because of my past experiences. I don't trust the pastor and no man to be around my wife because the, the previous generation always messed around. I don't trust nobody and so I don't go to church because of my past experiences. And so we in the church, come to church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, doing the same old thing because we're covered up underneath the statement, I can forgive, but I can't forget it. Amen. The greatest hurt is family hurt and church hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say it again. The greatest hurt is family hurt and church hurt. Folk don't go to family reunions because their family hurt. Folks don't go to church because their church hurt. And so all of us are in this box because many of you, I didn't take the survey, but I promise you if I did, many of you would have checked yes. And many of us would have been leaders in this congregation and we would have checked yes. This is my mentality. I, I can forgive, but I can't forget, which means that my past is still hoovering over me and it controls my relationship. And so what happens is this. When I get into the right condition and I get into the right circumstances and I have the right people around me, I put up a defense mechanism because I can't forget because I don't want to go back and experience that demon Sullivan. And so every time you come and shake my hand, I'm thinking about, well, what do he have intended for me? Mm. What is he trying to get me into? I know, I know this is the red pill and it's hard right now. What, 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 what scheme do he have for my life? What scheme do they have for my life? And they don't have nothing but sincere love for me. Yes. But I keep that defense mechanism up and I keep that brick wall up so that I can keep the right folk out of my life. 
Amen. Along with the wrong folk. Because my intention is, Elder, is to keep the wrong folk out, but I'm keeping also the right people out. Thank you, Jesus. Watch this. So, we're living in a state of what I call the score or the scale. We live in most of the time our life, Brother Thomas, in a scalp condition. That statement keeps us in a scalp condition whereby we have a, a process of our skin healing and it's, it's scattering over. But guess what? As soon as you put the band-aid on it and pull it off, you remember the pain. You remember how it felt to be left alone. I remember how it felt to sit there and watch my friend have his brother and his, his, my friend have his mama and his daddy at the supper table and they sit and they eat together as a family and then I go home to a stepdaddy and a mama and then I have another daddy and a stepmama but in my mind why can't I be just like a friend Well, I don't have to go to two houses on Thanksgiving. Why, why, why do I have to come from a broken family? Why do I have to be in this broken relationship? Why do they not have the opportunity to do it right? Why can't I experience just one set of family? As good as it may have been, I still just wanted my daddy to be around all the time. And some of y'all can say that you're sitting there and now you're wondering about those things in your life. And so now you have these experiences and as soon as it comes up, that pain that you remember because you have that scab on you. You remember how it felt. You remember the pain. But if you can ever get to the process where it becomes a scar, you will look at yourself and I can't remember some of this stuff that I've gone through. Some of you got scars and you don't remember what the situation was. But you got a scab and it comes back to you quickly. Because the scar means that you're healed. Amen. And so you look down at your scars and you see your wounds and you see your struggles. You see what you have been through, but you don't remember the pain because you have disassociated yourself from the pain. Watch this. Watch this. This is why we're struggling. Because we cannot disassociate from the pain. We're living in a state of anger. We're mad. We're in the church. That's why we can't have a conversation with someone in the church. Because we're angry. Yeah. We're in the church. Yeah. We're here for each other because we are a community. We're here to nurture and develop each other. But we can't get along in the place whereby we are to nurture ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Why are we mad at church? Yeah. When we all are delivered and on the king's highway, going to that great yonder, where we're going to a place that made and paved the streets of gold and the 12 gates, yes. and yet still, we're mad. Yeah, yeah. It's because we're living with a scam. Amen. And so every time I get close to that scam ah. and I start pulling My that God. Scab, you're going to get mad. My God. But if I rub your scar, you won't even react. Wow. This is where we're at in today's church. And God is causing us, calling us to learn how to not be infected with anger and malice and to disassociate ourselves from that. He's calling us to the spiritual discipline of fellowship. Amen. Sermon point number three. Amen. How do I? disassociate myself. I do it. First of all, I have to learn how to pull off that stuff. Amen. I got to let it go. Amen. Let it go. And then, I have to cover myself 
in love. Amen. Not just any type of love. Not filo love. Not uterus love. Agape love. Amen. Whereby I'm loving unconditionally. unconditionally. Yes. Philo love, brotherly love, means that we have to have some common stuff. The companionship love means that I have fallen in love with you and I want to take you out on a date. Agape love says, I just love you because I love you. Amen. Doesn't matter what you do to me. Don't matter what you do for me. I love you. Watch this, so, 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 in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, it says this, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are upon the earth. Verse 3, 4, ye died, and your life is hidden with Christ. In God. Christ have loved us. And we have to hide ourselves in that love. Amen. We have to cover ourselves in that love. Look, look at verse 5 and 7. It says, put on, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fortification, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, for which things say cometh the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, wherein you also once walk when you live in these things. How many of you can say, I live in that stuff that was previous verse? That means we're all saved, right? We are, we are disassociating ourselves from our past. We're disassociating ourselves from our wrong desires. We're disassociating ourselves from our wrong conversations. And we're putting on Christ. We're hiding ourselves under Christ. Look, watch what verse 17 says. Verse 17 says, For whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks unto God the Father through him. When I put Christ on, then I will forgive and not live under the blanket of I can forgive, but I can't forget. Because to forgive and not forget doesn't glorify the name of the Lord. Yes, yes. But to forgive and forget will glorify Jesus' name and we can tell him thank you in thank all things. Yes. Watch this. God, this is a spiritual discipline because of the fact that, remember, spiritual disciplines is up to us to do it. God isn't going to send Gabriel. He's not going to send Michael. He's not going to give his Holy Spirit to give us the power. We have to have it in our own selves. Yeah. Watch this. God did not take off clothes. Did y'all catch that? He didn't have to because he made us naked. So he didn't have to take off clothes. Uh-huh. And he's not putting on clothes. He put clothes on one time. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, when Adam and Eve were sitting there, and Adam said, and Adam also and his wife did to the Lord make coats of skin and clothe them. It was one time whereby God made clothes. Now he can sustain clothes like he did for Israel in the wilderness, but he's not taking them on and he's not putting them off. He's not putting them off and he's not putting them on. He did it one time. And he did it one other time for our spirit man when Jesus hung on the cross. Now, for all this anger, for all this malice, for all this hateful talk, for all this backbiting, for all this envy and jealousy, and all of this malice and clamor and disarray and dysfunction, that is up to us to take it off. Amen. Amen. It is up to us to change our mind. Amen. It is up to us to get beyond our past. Amen. It is up to me to get beyond my disappointments. Yes. It is up to me to get, get beyond my downfalls. Yes. My yes. Yes. All of that stuff that life has brought up to me. It is up to me to get beyond it. Amen.
Amen. He died so that you can have victory. Watch this. So in Psalms 103, and I'm almost done. Watch what he says in Psalms 103. He says this, blessed. Wait a minute, hold on. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. And abiding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he. Nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. For as east is from the west, and as far as he is removed, uh, he has removed our transgressions from us. How dare we? If God has not upheld and dealt with us with our transgressions the way he should. How dare we hold humanity to a state yeah. that God has Amen. Amen. How can we hold Man. a grudge? How can we block a person who by nature yes. is bad. Yes. It's not like we're, we're ob ob oblivious to the fact that we all got a bad nature in us. If God didn't hold us to our bad nature, if God would look out across heaven to find a redeemer to bring us yes. back, not yes. hold us to that and provide yes. us grace or merit of yeah, favor, Lord. if God would do it for us, would give us the right yeah, yeah. to stand on the mountain and declare you're wrong and you're going to stay there until you prove My it. God. But yet and still we know there was never proof and then we hold everybody else that we come in contact yeah. with the same standard because that's what we expect. Yeah. Watch this last one. So here's what Jesus says as he's finishing the sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5. <laughs> Jesus declares these words. You have heard that it was said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and do what? Uh-huh. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you. That you may that, that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good and sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust for if you love them that love you what reward do you have do not even the publicans the same let me stop right there how dare we again we can't cause nothing to rain we can go out and dance with, with the Alabama Kashala tribe down in East Texas and think that it's going to rain and we're going to hope that it's going to rain and we can do the rain dance all night long and it's still not rain. But God can make it rain on the just and the unjust and then he'll turn around and forgive us and how dare we look at folk down our unrighteous nose. Come on here. And declare yeah. that I can forgive you. Amen. But I can't forget what you did. Mm. 